Hey guys, hope you're all doing well. Today I want to talk to you about a few things I've been really interested in recently. The first one is DSLs, and that is basically a domain-specific language. And the idea behind it is that you simplify a specific use case and make a language based around it. So for example, regular expressions would be an example of it, uh, SQL would be an example of it, awk would be an example of it. Instead of having a general purpose language, you're basically simplifying it to a very small language that you can use for that use case instead of having to constantly be reinventing the wheel every time you're doing something new. So this kind of allows you to make your code very concise and allows you to simplify things. And that's why programs like awk are so common on the command line because you can really do everything in a couple one-liners for the most part. So while I've been looking into DSLs, one thing that I've noticed is that when it comes to writing your own, which I've been mostly interested in, there's one language that stands above the rest, and that is known as Racket. Racket itself is a version of Scheme, which Scheme itself is actually a version of Lisp, and Lisp has been around way back before most languages have existed, and the biggest thing that's drawn a lot of people to it is its basis around mathematics, and it was technically the start of functional programming. Some may say there's other examples that would really be the start of functional programming, but as far as a lot of people are concerned, Lisp is one of the first functional languages. Now, as I said, Lisps go way back in the day, but there are still some that are used today. Racket is one of them, but another Lisp would be Common Lisp, and another one that most of you may have heard of is Clojure. If you haven't heard of any of these, don't worry about it. It's not very important for this video because this video will be giving you a very, very simple introduction to Racket. And on its way, we'll show you a bit more about Scheme. And then hopefully in a future video, I'll be able to show you guys how you yourselves can write your own DSL. Now, the cool thing about Lisp is the fact that it can be modified and everything. But the cool thing about Racket is that it extends past this and allows you to change the syntax itself. And that is why it is so common for people to write DSLs in Racket, because you can actually modify the syntax and basically import the syntax as if it was a library. And then because of this, you can use a very concise language and you can do some really interesting stuff. I'll put some examples of some DSLs down in the description because this is really just going to be an introduction. And sadly, I can't cover all the way up to writing a whole another language in just one video. If you guys are interested, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell icon so you guys will get notified of my next video. Anyways, guys, without any more delays, let's get into the tutorial. So if you guys need to install Racket, you can actually go to racketlang.org and hit download and then it will give you a way to install it. If you guys are on Linux, then I would recommend using your guys' package manager to install it instead. Now, if you guys install the full version of Racket, you'll actually get Dr. Racket. And then when you open up Dr. Racket, you can actually do all your Racket editing in here. Um, you're going to possibly want to choose language, um, and then it will give you some options, and you'll want to do Racket language. right? And then it will just put your lang up here. And then you can start going. So the first thing, you can actually write your first part of Racket Lang by just doing hello world. And then technically, this will just evaluate to hello world. So what I can do is I can go over here and I can hit run. And there we go. We've technically just done hello world. Very simple, very easy. Now let's go ahead and actually do this from the terminal, which is what I will be using for the rest of this video. So really quickly, I'm just going to explain what a REPL is. A REPL is really simple. It basically is a simple way to be able to read print eval is where it comes from so you can actually do bracket and it will open up a REPL, REPL for you so now what you can do is we could do what we had before hello world and there we go it evaluates the hello world now we also have one which will value to one two values to two two evaluates to 1.2 um, if you guys are used to a lot of other languages that allow for interpretation then this will be pretty normal for you all right, so I've just given us a really simple file setup. So right here, I have a file called tmp.rkt, and then I have hash lang racket. Now this will be all evaluated as racket. So now if I did a hello, and then evaluated this whole file, it will do the same sort of thing as if I actually just manually copy pasted this into a REPL, which is what I have down here. So now I have some simple key bindings that allow me to pass everything back and forth between my REPL really quickly, but I'm just going to go through this and we're just going to learn some stuff as we go along. So like I said before, we do one and then it evaluates to one and then we could do 2.2, 2.3, and then that evaluates to 2.3. So pretty simple. Now we're going to get into something a bit more complex. So now that we know that we can use numbers, we can use strings. We also have true and false. So the way that we do true is we do hash T true and then hash f for false, all right? And then just like before, 
and that just evaluates to what it is. All right, so pretty simple. Now let's get into something that you'll be using a lot in Lisp or in pretty much any Lisp, which is lists. So the traditional way to create a list is you use this sort of syntax. So you use a single quote and then a bracket, and then you'll make your list. So we'll put our list one, two, three. You can actually put other things. So you can make this instead a string, and then maybe make this a, uh, let's just make this true. And so here is our list. So now if I evaluate this, it evaluates to our list. So pretty simple. Now I'm sure a lot of you guys are wondering, how can I define a variable? So we're gonna do define, and we actually have to put it in a bracket, and then we are going to do a, and we're gonna call that a, give the a the value one. So we're defining a, and we're giving it the value one. Pretty simple. And then when we do a, so, G, so there we go, so it defined that definition, and then a evaluates to one. So now that we know how to make a list and how to make a variable, we probably wanna be able to do some actual stuff with them. So something that you may wanna do is you can actually use a function. So functions are actually used by doing the function's name and then it's arguments. So we do arg, arg, this would be func, right? And so this might seem a bit strange if you're used to other languages, but it's pretty simple. This would be the equivalent to func bracket arg, arg, right? So this is how you guys can kind of think of it. And it makes things a lot more easy because you can kind of give as many arguments as you need for a specific function. Um, it simplifies the syntax a bit more. Now the first function we're gonna use is we're gonna just add. So we're gonna do plus one, one. And then if we add one to one, we evaluate to two. And then we can do the same thing with a, and that evaluates to two because a is just that, just a one. And then if we do that again with a two, we get three. Now you could actually do subtraction, and then this actually subtracts one from two using a, so it's two minus one is the equivalent to this, all right? So pretty simple. Now let's move a bit further and let's define our own function. Now when it comes to defining your own function, it's actually a really interesting process in scheme-like languages and most Lisps as far as I know. And the idea is very simple. You basically are actually defining a variable. So you know how we did defining a variable? So we do define a one like we had before. But now instead, we're actually defining A as something else. So there is a shorthand that you'll often see, which is just doing define, and we'll give A, so A, and then it takes an arg, we'll give A the arg arg, and then we're just gonna have it do plus one arg. And so then we define it, and then we can just do A one, all right? And that basically executes our function. The main thing to notice here is that we actually have uh, these braces around it, or brackets, and the brackets around it are actually what allow you to say that something is a function, because without this, it will instead be acted as if it was just any other variable. When we do that, it will be like, oh, this is a procedure, because instead we're trying to turn our macro, or our function, um, into a variable. Now, while we just defined our own function right here, You'll notice that when I called the function as if it was just a variable or any other constant, it said it was a procedure. So we actually have a function with the same name as a. This is kind of strange. And the reason for this is because a is actually the same sort of thing as a constant. Instead, it's actually a procedure. And the way that this actually is, is this is actually shorthand. And I actually did instead, I could do a, so we're gonna make its argument. So a is going to have an argument and we're gonna have it as a lambda. And then we're gonna give it arg. Um, this may seem a bit confusing at first, but you'll understand in a second. And then we just need one more, those. Now assuming that I just mixed everything up properly, which I think I did, we still get that a as a procedure. But if we do a just like before, one, a works the same as before. And that is because this is basically shorthand for this. We're defining a variable, a, as a lambda that takes an argument arg, and then it basically executes this function. A lambda is basically a nameless function, is how you can think of them. And so this is basically the idea of it, and this is how you'd actually use it. Now, the cool thing about this is you can actually do some really interesting stuff with this because you can actually use a function without having to define it with a name. So a good example of this would be using a map. A map is basically a way to execute something on every single element in a list. So let's go ahead and do that. So we can actually do map, so map 
and then we're going to map instead of actually defining anything we're actually just going to call it a lambda and then it's going to take the arg item and then on top of that uh it is actually going to whoops we're going to add item one so we're going to add one to every item in the list and then and then after that we are going to actually give it what it wants to map to we're just going to go one two three four five all right and so while this may seem a bit confusing you can look at it like this so we're mapping this function right here onto this list so now if we executed this we get two three four five six so that's a really interesting and simple way to basically execute something on every single list Whereas in some languages like C, you'd often use something like a function pointer, which is pretty complex and not very introductory friendly. This is something that you can kind of wrap your head around pretty quickly, even if you're new to the language. So just to separate everything out to make it a bit more simple, we are doing this. We have the argument item, add to every item, and then we're mapping to this list. Now we're gonna move on to uh, if statements. If statements um, seem a bit confusing if you don't see them in a very friendly way of writing them, but I'll write them in a fairly easy to understand way. So the way you'll do this is you'll do if, and then you'll give it something. So we're just gonna do one. Actually, we're just gonna do, yeah. So we're gonna do if equals. So equals is how you would check if something is equal to another thing. We're gonna do if one equals one. So this should evaluate to true then. So then here, I'm basically doing if one equals one, then print this or evaluate this string, else evaluate this string. And then it will evaluate, yes, this is true. And then, and then otherwise it will evaluate, no, this is false. Now there's a few other things that you can do. So for example, you could do positive question mark, and then this will check if it is positive. Um, there's lots of different ones and and feel free to look at a lot of different ones and then like you would expect positive false so this is a really common syntax and something that you've probably noticed already is that actually functions can be different symbols and contain different symbols so that's how we were able to do adding earlier on now before we go on i want to show off how you can do some stuff with lists that we'll need for later on in this video which is um, actually grabbing information out of a list so we're going to just define a list so like i said before define then we're just going to call it lie um, and then we're going to define it as we're going to make our list and we're just going to do one two three four five and then that will be our list and there we go so we've defined our list li so now if i just did li it will be defined as a list so pretty simple now if i wanted to get information out of it say for example if i did car um, on li this will actually get the first entry from the list. So here it's grabbing one from the start of the list. And then you can actually do CDR and this will get the rest of the list besides the start. So pretty simple and you can actually do a lot of different stuff with this. But the main idea here is that we can grab the first part and separate it from the last part. So a pretty simple idea. So just like before, car to grab the start and CDR to grab the rest of the list. Now the reason I showed this off is because I wanted to show you guys how you can do iteration with something like a for loop or anything like that. Instead of using a for loop, we're actually gonna use recursion. Now the simplest example of how we can do this is just summing up a list. Because while maps can uh, do something on every single entry in the list, it doesn't really allow you to do stuff like actually adding it all up. Now this is where something like recursion comes into play because it allows you to simulate something like a for loop where you'd want to Say, for example, iterate over everything in the loop in a list and then add it all up. Now, let's go ahead and show off how you guys can do this. One of the easiest examples that I can think of is basically just summing up a list. So you've got a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You add that all up and you get the total of the elements in the list. So let's go ahead and try this out. We're going to do define and we've got to give ourselves a list. So we're going to do define li. Um, now, we don't really need to define a list, but I think this will be easiest. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so we've defined our list. Now we need to define our function. So we're going to do define, and we're going to define a function called sum. And it's going to take an argument uh, li. I guess that would work. All right, and it's going to take that element li, and we're going to do if. And then our condition will be um, empty empty and then we're going to check and see if our list is empty then return zero 
else. What we are going to return is we are actually going to return. So we're going to add as part of our return. And then first element of list. And then how we're going to return that is we're actually going to do car like we showed off a second ago. So grabbing the first element of the list, li. And then we are going to do get the rest of the list. Now that's the rest of the list. Now we want to sum the rest of the list. So we're going to do sum. And then we're going to get the rest of the list, cdr, li. And then we're just going to close this all up. All right. And so here we're summing up the rest of the list. Now when I say sum, it's passing that list back into itself. So here's how it'll end up looking. All right. So we've got our list. Now we're going to go through it a few times. So the first time we're going to go through, we're going to see if it's empty. It's not empty. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add. And then we're going to add the first part of our list. So, so add the first part of the list to the sum of the rest of the list. Now we've got this and we're going to go into that function right here. And what's going to happen is we're going to go ahead and see, is it empty? No. And then instead what we're going to do is we're going to go add the start of the list, which is now two to the rest of the list. All right, so pretty simple. And then this is going to basically continue. All right, it's gonna go all the way and then we're going to get to here where it's gonna say sum of an empty list. And then when it checks, it's gonna be, oh, this is empty, so return zero. So now we're gonna go ahead and give this a try. So we're just gonna go like this. We're gonna go ahead and send this to the REPL. And then we're just gonna do sum and we're gonna do LI. Sum of LI is 15. And if we actually added all this up, we get 15. So pretty simple idea. And because of this, it allows you to do some really interesting stuff using recursion. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. And you can pretty much do everything you would need to do with a for loop. But as you can see, it can keep things quite concise. And it can also, once you get used to it, this actually seems very similar to what you get with a for loop. Where in a for loop, you'd have a condition of when it ends. And here we're just saying, end when this is empty. And then it's basically just going to iterate and do each of these steps as we go along. So pretty simple. Um, if you guys are having trouble with this, make sure to hit me up, ask me some questions. I am far from an expert in Racket. In fact, this video is more just meant as an introduction so I can talk about it in a future video because at the current moment, I purely am just trying to get more comfortable with it so I can start working a bit more on writing my own DSLs just to learn a bit more about it and get a bit more in touch with the language. Anyways, guys, I hope you've all enjoyed this really quick introduction to working with Racket. And hopefully if you guys are interested, we can cover DSLs in the future and learning about how, write, how we can write our own DSLs. But the next video on this topic will actually be using a DSL, which I actually have used quite a bit, called Slideshow. And in it, we'll actually be covering how you guys can make your own slideshows using Racket. Anyways, guys, I'll see you next time. I hope you've enjoyed. If you did enjoy, make sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell icon so you guys get notified of my next video. Anyways, guys, I'll see you next time.